historical record, act of protest, ghost story. Paul Lawrence Dunbar creates all of this in one of American literature's most important poems. Welcome to a reading, summary, and analysis of The Haunted Oak. Pray, why are you so bare, so bare, O bough of an old oak tree? And why, when I go through the shade you throw, runs a shudder over me? My leaves were green as the best I trow, and sap ran free in my veins. But I saw in the moonlight, dim and weird, a guiltless victim's pains. I bent me down to hear his sigh, I shook with his gurgling moan, and I trembled sore when they rode away and left him here alone. They'd charged him with the old, old crime and set him fast in jail. Oh, why does the dog howl all night long, and why does the night wind wail? He prayed his prayer, and he swore his oath, and he raised his hand to the sky, but the beat of hooves smot in his ear, and the steady tread drew nigh. Who is it rides by night, by night, over the moonlit road? And what is the spur that keeps the pace? What is the galling goad? And now they beat at the prison door. Ho, keeper, do not stay. We are friends of him who you told within, and we fain would take him away from those who ride fast on our heels with mind to do him wrong. They have no care for his innocence, and the rope they bear is long. They have fooled the jailer with lying words. They have fooled the man with lies. The bolts unbar, the locks are drawn, and the great door open flies. Now they have taken him from the jail, and hard and fast they ride, and the leader laughs low down in his throat as they halt my trunk beside. Oh, the judge, he wore a mask of black, and the doctor, one of white, and the minister with his oldest son was curiously bedight. O oh, foolish man, why weep you now? Tis but a little space, and the time will come when these shall dread the memory of your face. I feel the rope against my bark and the weight of him in my grain. I feel in the throe of his final woe the touch of my own last pain. And never more shall leaves come forth on the bough that bears the bane. I am burned with dread, I am dried and dead from the curse of a guiltless man. And ever the judge rides by, rides by, and goes to hunt the deer, and ever another rides his soul in the guise of a mortal fear. And ever the man he rides me hard, and never a night stays he, for I feel his curse as a haunted bough on the trunk of a haunted tree. One of the first things you'll notice if you read this poem out loud or listen to it is that it has a really distinctive meter and rhythm to it. And that is because Dunbar is using the ballad form for this poem. As you can tell, it's narrative, tells a story, it has a specific rhyme scheme, A, B, C, B. In this instance, there's a really distinctive meter, and it's a communal story. Unfortunately, it's a story that a lot of people could relate to at this time and even still today, even if they don't know the exact location. It's not something that's just about a single place. It's more community-minded. And it's a recent event. We'll talk about at the end of this video how this was actually based on a true story. And obviously, there's some supernatural elements in display with the haunted oak. To look at the poem in more detail here, I want to stress in this first stanza the long O sound that is invoked throughout. And this is a sound that we associate with mourning and with sadness. But by stanza two, we get a shift. We're no longer talking about the tree or really talking to the tree. The tree itself is speaking. And the tree has already undergone this transformation, and the catalyst for this transformation is witnessing guiltless pain. By stanza three, we see that there's actually more than just witness here. The tree has participated unwillingly in the crime. We're also introduced to the group that has accused him of the old, old crime, which is really just being black in the American South at this time but could be accused of pretty much anything, usually assault, and without trial, find yourself being hunted and executed. We also see highlighted here in yellow that while this mob has left him alone, he is not fully alone because nature 
has not turned its back on this scene. The tree is haunted, the dog is howling, and the wind is wailing, rebelling against this unnatural and unjust action that's being carried out. We do see in this instance this trial that is scheduled to take place. While the accused man is unjustly put in jail, he is put in jail. However, another group, one even more frightening, is fast approaching. This group convinces the jail keeper to hand over the man on the promise of salvation that they're actually going to save him, when in actuality, they are planning on taking his life. It's also really important to point out at this moment that we find out that the man is innocent. Dunbar leaves no shadow of a doubt that this person has been accused unjustly and is losing their life in a horrible, horrific way simply because they're black. And these next two stanzas show just this terrifying reality that sometimes jail was actually safer than being in one's own community. Once the man is taken out of jail, he's at the mercy of the mob, and there is no mercy in this mob. Some of the individuals in the mob are named in this next stanza here. We see the judge, the doctor, the minister, and his oldest son, who are all masked, participating in this murder. And it's interesting because that's not the exact same group, but it's a similar group to what you see in the Good Samaritan from the Bible, who in that story, the priest and the Levites and others walk past the injured man and do not help him. But this is even worse. They are not ignoring the crime, they are active participants in it. And then we see the tree address the man who he calls foolish, which I find very not comforting, but the tree is saying that the man is foolish to weep because this will not be the end of him. There will be a punishment of sort for the people carrying this out. Again, we see the participation of the tree with the I feel being repeated twice in the next stanza. That the tree has empathy. It is a living thing expressing empathy, but it is powerless to intervene. It's pretty horrible that a tree would be more empathetic than a person, but that seems to be the case here. And nature rots and dies in the face of this injustice. The branch at which the rope is hung will not grow leaves anymore. And this curse is really driven home by the alliteration of the B and the D sound repeated quite powerfully. In the conclusion of the poem, we see where the haunted nature of the oak comes in. It's not just that this branch will no longer bear leaves, it's also that the branch serves as a reminder of what a horrible thing has taken place here. The original meaning of haunting or haunted means to revisit something. So every time the judge rides by, rides by that repetition showing the repeated nature of having to pass by this tree, the fear clings to him repeatedly because the branch acts as a reminder. The victim is connected to the tree in the final stanza. There is almost a sense of freedom for the victim's soul, but the poem stops short of any sense of peace, and I think that's really important here. While there's some reprieve because this death doesn't go completely unpunished, nature does not turn its back on it or, or hide the crime. Dunbar is not saying that there's anything really positive in this. It, it's still a horrific, terrible thing that's happened, and it, it's something that was happening and continued to happen for, for decades after this in America. This poem is based on a historical event. Dunbar heard about a lynching in Alabama that someone told him about his, his nephew, that there was a tree that after the lynching, the tree refused to grow leaves. There were 105 recorded lynchings the year Dunbar wrote this poem in America. There were probably a lot more than that that were not recorded. And just like in the poem, many of these victims are, are unknown to this day. But this was something that Dunbar felt very compelled to write about. It shows up in a number of his writings, famously the lynching of Jube Benson, where a white man wearing blackface assaults a woman and then is a participant or a, a witness of that man being accused, tortured, and murdered for the crime. 
And as one scholar points out, writing about the KKK, lynch mobs, racial injustice, etc. required an immense amount of courage because retribution could be taken because of it. So Dunbar, in this expression of art, is also taking on additional risk when he, when he writes it, but it's something he felt compelled to do. In the introduction to Camille T. Dungy's Black Nature, Four Centuries of African American Nature Poetry, she points out that many black writers simply do not look at their environment from the same perspective as Anglo-American writers who discourse with the natural world. The pastoral as diversion, a construction of a culture that dreams through landscape and animal life, of a certain luxury or innocence is less prevalent. Rather, in a great deal of African American poetry, we see poems written from the perspective of the workers of the field. Though these poems defy the pastoral conventions of Western poetry, are they not pastorals? The poems describe moss, rivers, trees, dirt, caves, dogs, fields, elements of an environment steeped in a legacy of violence, forced labor, torture, and death. Later on in the intro, she specifically talks about how trees function in a lot of these poems. She says, These poems portray the grisly function America's trees have served and the shame that hangs about a place long after an awful deed is done. If you look at other writings, such as Frankenstein, for instance, Victor constantly goes to nature for rejuvenation and renewal and to feel better. It's a very European romantic view of nature. And that tends to be how I think a lot of people think nature is always written about, but that is not the case. That's not been everyone's experience or every culture's experience with nature. And what Dungi points out so articulately is that the nature that others might see as peaceful and beautiful uh, for a writer such as Dunbar was also a reminder of, of violence and torture. And while nature is definitely not the enemy in this poem, it's something that can't be separated from the natural world, which shows the, the, the depth and scope of this systemic hatred that was brought down upon black people in America. The last thing I want to talk about is Dunbar's use of an oak tree specifically. Now this could be simply because the story he was told it was an oak tree so he was being accurate, but Dunbar definitely knows his classics pretty well. He, he wrote in a lot of different styles and was, was comfortable in the old style of writing poetry. So I think he would have known what the oak tree represents, which is, is power, it is the, the tree of Zeus. It's a strong sturdy, powerful tree. And what we see here is that strength of the tree being used for for evil, malicious purposes, but also the tree being strong enough to serve as a, as a reminder and a witness to something that deeds, even if not punished in the immediate aftermath by, by humans, do not go forgotten, that, that lives are not meant to be thrown away. Nature is not there for us to use it against our fellow humans, but maybe perhaps rather to remember what it means to be human and how we should treat one another. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. I'll try to get to all of them. Uh, and also, if you have any other poems or short stories or plays that you'd like me to look at, please do uh, suggest them. Thanks again for watching. Have a good one and happy reading.